Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in uh, in today's uh, Fiverr Talk webinar series. I I am Rusafi Alam here with you, and uh, I hope during this pandemic uh, situation, everyone is doing safe along with their family. So as you already know, that our today's webinar topic is future proofing the fiber underground network. In this webinar, we will basically discuss the cable blowing and jating as a whole and their their background, that how it started, and uh, the advantages over other technologies, and uh, also the best practices for fiber deployment, uh, which will be future proof and uh, less modification intensive, meaning more profitability in longer term. So, I have uh, two gentlemen with me today uh, we will have two presentations today uh, the first one will be uh, cable blowing revolution and how it all started uh, by Willem Griffion and uh, the second presentation will be presented uh, the second presentation topic would be successful fiber network deployment using blowing and trenching by uh, Edwin from uh, Converge Philippines. So we will not uh, waste time anymore. I I will hand over to our first speaker shortly. Before uh, handing over, just just a uh, brief bio uh, of our first speaker. Uh, Willem Griffion currently works at Plometas. Uh, Switzerland and is responsible for R&D of cable installation techniques. Uh, from 1984 to 1998, he worked at KPN Research, uh, the Netherlands on outside plant and cable installation techniques. During his job, uh, he invented cable jetting. Uh, he is the cable jetting uh, inventor, you can say, a technique uh, he invented uh, is to install optical cables into ducts using a synergy of pushing and blowing uh, now widely used all over the world. He received his PhD uh, reliability of optical fibers in 1995 from the Eindhoven uh, Technology uh, Technical University the Netherlands from uh, and from 1998 to nine, uh, 2009, he worked at Draca Comtech in Delft, Gouda, and Amsterdam. So I am welcoming Mr. Uh, Dr. Willem Griffion. Please welcome. Show my screen. Okay, I hope you see all my screen. Uh, yes, everything. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, whatever time it is in your part of the world. It's morning here. I will tell you something about the cable blowing revolution, uh, how it all started. It's, a, it's an old story, I admit, but it's a revolution that's still ongoing. And in order to benefit from this revolution, it's good to know how it all started. And maybe you can continue the revolution. Uh, I'm going back now to 1986, a long time ago. At that time, uh, we had just uh, the time that the trunk network was uh, uh, replaced by optical cables. It was the Dutch PTT, but they had a tough job to replace those cables. The cable lengths were 2.1 kilometer, and splicing at that time was a very difficult job. So there was no way that they would cut the cable in shorter lengths. So it had to be installed without any splice. But the problem was that the pooling length was only 300 meter and sometimes even much less. And in order to do a flawless installation, it was needed to reduce the section to only 175 meter. So 
how do you do the installation then? They did it by midpoint buffering and figure eight capstans in tandem. Here you see this figure eight capstan, and it was put in a sequence of six sections. And every figure eight capstan, the cable was wrapped around those wheels, and uh, it was self running motor uh, pulling the cable. But you can understand that it's a not easy job. You have to wrap around first. You have to install the winch rope, and you have to wrap around that over the figure eight capstans. Then you have to connect to the cable, and then you have to pull it all. And they have all to work in a well synchronized way. Um, now that is not easy. Uh, they were working with portophones, and it was going like a class. Can you hear me? What did you say, Pete? I can't hear you. Uh, and then John said, "Are we going to start?" And then another one. I'm going to start now. No, 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 not yet. And then the cable was running off the of the figure eight capstan. And yeah, took one day to install half of the cable length, 1050 meter. And then they had to buffer figure eight. And then going to the next length again with the same technique. So it all took two days and it had to make one overnight. And sometimes this happened during the night. So they, they left it like here with the drum connected still. And then in the night, this happened. Next morning, the cable was gone. But these copper thieves, they were not aware that there was no copper in the cable. At that time, an optical cable was very, still very new. And yeah, the optical fibers they had, they could not do anything with it. So they were a lot, a little, rather disappointed. And so were we. So that was really a pain in the ass for the Dutch head offices, the Dutch PTT head offices, and they asked their research and development lab what could be wrong. They did already themselves some calculations based on friction and the capstan effect, and they could not explain it. The capstan effect that tells you that if you have a cable pulling force, every band gives a factor increase and that go, then grows exponentially. That's the reason that normally your pulling length is limited, but they could not explain the very low pulling force they found. Uh, they thought maybe that is the cable stiffness effect in beds that was the suspect but there's no theory known so i had to develop it at dutch ptt research laboratories and i'm not going to into detail with the theory i show you a picture used for the model and the formula and here you see the, the friction force that you have in the band and here is the cable stiffness the b and f is the coefficient of friction so we had a theory, but that could not explain the very short length. In fact, it was a rather low, small effect, this cable stiffness effect. Now, later we, we found the cause, and the cause is that straight is not really straight. If you look here in the trends, you see the straight duct has undulations, and they also represent direction change, just like bends. And there will be capstan effect, just like in bends. So for this, also a theory was developed. Then we have the direction change. We can find that in the model that it is uh, described by the amplitude of the undulations and the period of the undulations. And then this direction change can be calculated as the caption effect in the same way as it is done in bands. And if you do that, then you find that really the observed short pulling lengths are explained. So the cause was found. Now we have to solve the problem. We also checked the theory of the cable stiffness effect in undulations, not only in bands, also in undulations, but it's the same also here, the effect of the cable stiffness is small. So it's really the caption effect that causes the short pulling length. Now, thinking of a solution, we, we know that uh, already in 1982, British Telecom developed blown fiber. And blown fiber, that is a flexible and lightweight fiber member that is installed with the help of high-speed airflow. And the distributed air drag forces, they locally compensate the friction. And that can be done such that there's no actual pulling force built up in the, in the fiber member. So there's no caption effect. And that is what we need. We, the caption effect is our problem. And Okay, but blown fiber was known as limited to flexible and lightweight fiber members only. But we did calculation on the stiffness effect and there is not a problem with cable stiffness. 
So let's try to calculate. And then the, solution, uh, the, the, the result is that it might be possible really to install the cable by blowing. So time to give it a try. So here you see the test area in Radio Kootwijk in the Netherlands, uh, the property of the Dutch PTT. And they tested there the field with, with four loops around. And there the figure eight captions were tested to see whether they work in tandem. Four of them in, in tandem operation. And I calculated, I can blow two loops. So I proposed to do a test. But the people were not really enthusiastic. In fact, no one believed it would work except the chief. So that was the reason that we could do the test. They also claimed it was already tried earlier, but what they tried earlier was the wrong way. It is the same way as they installed the winch line. And then they, they drilled a little bit bigger hole that the cable could be blown through. They inserted the cable and there was a pick at the end, but this is air, air pressure. But you see uh, there's a plug in front of the cable, so there's no high speed airflow. So that is not present. And also, if you push the cable inside, you have to push it with a force. And uh, this force, uh, you, you, if you don't do that, it comes back as a, a pulling tension here in the cable. And then you start already, already immediately with the caption effect. So this is not the way to do it. The way to do it is, is without the plug in front and to push it. But we had no machine. So we had to do it manually. And this is not an easy work, I can tell you. So we tried it this way. So now we have the high speed airflow and we needed to push, but only small strokes you can do with hand. And it was hard work. We had to turn men by men to do it with four men, uh, four complaining men. Uh, no, not three, I must say, because I was one of them. And the first, after the first loop was passed, they got silent. And then we passed the second loop and they said, oh, it's a miracle. I told them, I, I calculated it. I said it would go. So as long as you are still not at the end, you try to go further. So we also passed the third loop. And we passed the third loop, fourth loop. So it worked and much better than, than calculated. So this was a miracle still. But OK, it was clear we have a nice technique and we have to develop it. But pushing by hand is not an option. What we need is a motor here that pushes the cable inside and does the, the pushing work. Now let's go back first. Uh, why did we reach twice the cable distance? Now air is compressible, expanding towards the end and gaining velocity. So also the air drag forces to increase towards the end. And that was not uh, realized by, by British Telecom, uh, this effect. And also we pushed harder than needed to insert the cable. So we, have, we are left with some extra pushing force. Now, in fact, what we discovered is that we have an, a, a pushing force synergy with the air drag forces, which is doubling the length. Now what's happening first, if you have double length, you have half the air drag forces, but you assist with pushing. And then this pushing force has a very long action because it's partly helped by by the air drag forces and if you go further it's helped more and more and then gradually the pushing force they take over and so the uh, the, the air drag for, uh, forces they take over so the pushing force decreases that you need and the result is that you finally reach twice the blowing distance this was already shown now in the test we did but it was also calculated and this was the basis for a patent in 1987. now here you see a pro uh, that is the patent text it's a little bit more than uh, than just a cable blowing machine. And here you see also the pictures that were used in the calculation to prove that we reach twice the distance. So we need cable stiffness. It's not for flexible and lightweight fiber members. So this is the difference. And it's the basis for a pattern that we got. So it's time to make a machine. Now, this is the prototype. And here you can see it in operation. The first machine that was tested in a field installation, not anymore at the uh, Kootwijk uh, test area. And what we did is we could blow 700 meter. Oh, that is much better. And then even after that, we could do a longer pulling length than we used because the cable comes out with excess forces because of the excess air drag forces at the end. So we could do the whole 1050 meter in one go without any intermediate machine. Um, 
So you understand that the prototype, we didn't get it back. It was not returned to the lab. Now they could install the 2.1 kilometer in one day. So we had to make three more machines to let them work in tandem. And this we tested also in the field for in tandem, and that was really working super. It was a much higher production. So immediately we had to make 30 more machines for all the crews working in the Netherlands installing fiber optic cable. And in only four months time from the very beginning, this governmental institute switched from pulling to blowing seven crews in competition for the maximum production because they were very motivated and they all wanted to beat each other. One crew, crew even reached six kilometer, uh, six, six cables of 2.1 kilometers or 12 kilometers in one day. And eight kilometer in production in one day was not an exception. So this is a really major step forward, 60 times faster than two days for one cable. Now, the advantages of cable blowing, uh, if you pull with the winch, so this is in general, not only for the Dutch uh, PTT. If you have a winch pulling, then you miss uh, some things. First, you have a two-step operation. First, the winch line to install, and then you have to connect it. And then you have a winch on the other side as the drum, so you have equipment and labor on two sides of the trajectory. So this is all what you would like to get rid of. Now, the solution is if you blow, then you have the solution. Then you have a happy installer. All the operation is from one side and you don't need to install a winch line first. Furthermore, you have low forces, no cable wear, long distances you can reach, also in trajectory with bands, no synchronization problems and high speed. To give you a few numbers, 5.3 kilometer today is the blowing record. 180 meter per minute is the maximum speed we reach today. And 12 kilometer installed in one day. That is already an old record. And maybe it has been beaten, but I don't have the data of that. Now, that was the success in the Netherlands, but you understand this could not stay in the Netherlands. The first uh, trajectory, uh, first project outside the Netherlands was in Spain. That was the optical link from Madrid to Sevilla for the World Expo in 1992. And this project was awarded to the Dutch cable manufacturer NKF. And it was NKF that produced the cable for the Dutch PTT. And their selling argument was, you can blow these cables. Yeah, now we know almost all cables can be blown, but uh, they got the job and they did a nice job. And it was done, done not with the machines made by the Dutch PTT, but at that time it was a Plumet machine. And that was uh, produced in worldwide exclusive license from the Dutch PTT. So they had for 20 years the exclusive license. Now we also have a second revolution. Uh, I want to see my time. Yeah, okay. Second revolution, um, loose bundles of microducts, we can blow them in a protected duct. And that was, uh, this the technique was introduced in the Netherlands also by the Dutch PTT in 1999. But the team was not only Dutch PTT, also NKF was again involved. It's now Prismian. Uh, the Dutch PTT is now KPN. If you want to find wh wh where the company is, Mainetti, a tube manufacturer, it's now called Amtel. Eden, they produce the push pull couplings and also the larger uh, T con uh, and Y connector. And Plumetas, of course, as an installing company or a, a company to produce installation uh, equipment. Now here you see a duct, and in that duct you can blow a bundle of microducts. Now here you can see how the blowing was done. It is with a super jet, and then they can blow uh, all kinds of configurations of microduct bundles inside an already installed duct. Another thing is that we had to make the cables smaller. At that time the cables were much bigger, so we re reduced the or NKF reduced the 9.6 millimeter cable to a 3.9 millimeter cable and also more fibers. And that could be blown in a microduct of only seven millimeter. And we could have seven of those microducts in a 40 millimeter duct. Here you see no, 10 micro, microducts of seven millimeter. Here you see seven microducts of 10 millimeter. But that's also a configuration that is possible. And that can then be later blown in. And here you see 
the blowing equipment. This is a microjet blowing the microduct cables inside a microduct in such a network. Now, the advantages of the microduct uh, technique is that the, the cables, they are smaller, they are compact, high fiber density. It's parallel upgradable, pay as you grow. So if you install, if you only need a low, small number of fibers, you install all the microducts and then you only install a cable in the microduct that you are going to use and the rest is for later. Uh, also, it is serial upgradable. If you have a, an area of houses where you build your network and it's later behind that there is another area of network, you just install all the tubes you need and connect the houses you need. And then later, when the other area is built, you make new ducts and you connect them and all the micro ducts you connect with simple push-pull connectors. So serial upgradable. Now here you see an example of a network, trunk network, a long haul, uh, redundant uh, network. Uh, this, uh, that is the, the secondary access network. And then you have the drop to the homes, fiber to the home. And this is a connector in the larger duct where you make branching of the small micro ducts. And then you can go with your, your you make a, a, a connector, micro duct connector push pull, and you can blow through the branch without any splice. So it's easy branching without splice, just using push pull connectors, any place, any time. And also very nice is the redundant connection where you can work with all the fiber count if the, compared to the traditional network. For instance, here you have your business customers. If you want to redundantly connect them with a regular technique, then you have all your fibers you need in the cable and you go to this, 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 and the end customer. And then from the other side, you have to use the same cable with the same fiber amount. But now with the redundant technology, you go with the number of microducts you need and cables in this direction. And the other direction, you can use the empty microducts to connect from the other side. So that saves half of the number of fibers. Now there is also the tight bundled microducts, and the tight bundled microducts are more like uh, how British Telecom did it in the beginning. They they started also with uh, microducts, but then tight bundled microducts, and we have several configurations: round and uh, strips or flatliners. But if you direct bury them, then you have to watch out for micro undulations. And of course, you can install the cables. Here you can see a test that we did. But we know that we had problems sometimes with blowing cables in uh, in such uh, direct buried microduct bundles. And this is test. We bury them uh, in the ground. We make a trench and then fill it with soil. And then we backfill and compact the soil. And that causes pressure on the ducts, on the microduct bundles, and they take the, the soil undulations. So after, so we did blowing tests and we found much less blowing length. And also we dug it up and then you see the residual. So it was even no, worst case, worse in the ground, but even the residual undulations were terrible. So that was explaining that this is not a good way to install your microduct bundles. Uh, to install microduct bundles and especially the strips that are the most vulnerable, there is importantly a better technique, and that will be treated in the next presentation. So I will end my presentation here. Just thank you for your attention, and I hope you can benefit from those revolutions. And for further email, uh, for further information, you can email me or you can contact Plumata Sigma Singapore, where you find uh, Michael van Moppers or Royston Tan to help you with your questions. And also for the diehard fans that want to further reading, books and papers are on our website, the Plumata's website. Uh, you have to go to the website and then press About Us, and then Knowledge Center. It's a bit, bit difficult to find, but if you do this, you find a big list of articles and papers, uh, also a few books, and you can learn from it. And if you have questions, you can contact me again. Thank you for your attention once more, I and my presentation here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Willem.
uh, it was really nice presentation hearing all the backgrounds about uh, cable jating and gluing technology that was really revolutionary technology and uh, we will now uh, welcome uh, our second speaker today uh, mr edwin mabitazan uh, he's from Converge ICT Solutions, Philippines. Uh, Edwin is the group head of planning and engineering for Converge ICT. His primary role is to implement the business plan in terms of network rollout of FTTH lines. As you know, Converge ICT uh, Solutions is a Philippines-based pure fiber uh, ISP. So uh, regarding uh, Edwin uh, joining this company last uh, 2014, uh, 2014 uh, Edwin has successfully rolled out the project main thoroughfare, having implemented FTTH lines in due time. His expertise in both wear and wireless transmission planning and implementation and fiber optic networks enables him to do strategic planning project and business planning, KTEC, COPEX, budgeting, high level and low level detailed engineering, traffic, road engineering, etc. So I'm welcoming uh, Edwin Mabutazan for uh, our second session. His topic would be uh, successful fiber network deployment using blowing and trenching. Please welcome Edwin. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm, again, I'm Ed from Converge uh, ICT. Now, my topic today is our successful fiber network deployment using micro trenching and micro docks. But to start with, let me introduce first our company, who we are. Uh, Converse is a multi-service telecom operator with nationwide congressional franchise. We are in operation uh, since 1992. We have 24 years of reliable and quality ICT and a broadcast. We started with HFC, cable TV, and right now we are on the FTTX, both FTTH and FTTB. Our primary uh, customers are the public, public sector. We have corporates, SMEs, but the uh, majority of our customers now are called the consumer market. We call them Metro Manila, less of Luzon, and we are now aggressively expanding to the other parts of the Philippines, namely Visayas and Mindanao. As uh, the news has uh, said, we are the fastest growing fiber internet in the Philippines. And uh, last June, the report says that we have already is, uh, connected oops, about 731,000 uh, subscribers, capturing about 54% of the market uh, share in, in the Philippines. Now, uh, as I said, we started in 1992. Uh, the company founder is Mr. Dennis Anthony Uy. We started as a cable TV uh, and we slowly grow up. In 2008, we started doing uh, fiber. We started uh, connecting fiber in Metro Manila and then slowly grow up. But uh, in uh, 2011 and 2012, we also receive our congressional franchise to as a uh, telco. Now, because of the uh, expansion of the project, there was a need then to establish a dedicated company to uh, roll out the project of Converse. That's when uh, Metroworks uh, was launched. Uh, Metroworks was launched in 2013, primarily to, uh, to expand and to establish and to uh, interconnect all the project of uh, Converge. Right now, Metroworks is 
the implementing arm and it is the fully it's a fully subsidiary of converts now the focus uh, of metroworks is uh, as i've said it was established in 2013 to build the backbone infrastructure of converts ict and then uh, by doing this it allowed uh, converts to connect uh, to its customers fast and uh, on time and within budget Metrobus build the wireless fiber optic coverage in NCR. NCR is the national capital region. Uh, it's Metro Manila. And we also, converts, uh, Metrobus also uh, established a project in South Luzon and Central Luzon. Now, predominantly, we build our uh, fiber backbone, backbone using uh, underground. Underground, we are using micro trenching for the uh, CBDs or commercial districts or urban areas. But in the provinces, we do uh, make use of HDD. In both cases, uh, metro trenching and HDD, we use microducts. We also build corporates, uh, FTTB, in the metropolis and consumer connectivity in major villages in the national capital region. Now, uh, our vision, our vision is really to uh, help our government and the municipalities or cities to bring down all these spaghetti wires in, uh, say, urban areas. If you take a look on the left side of the picture, this is what really what we see in the metropolis. On the right side, it's the ideal or our vision. The right side picture is in um, Ayala. So if you notice, if we can do that, then we will be able to help uh, the security, even the beautification of all uh, LGUs. Let me discuss uh, our experience in uh, micro trenching and HDD. Our strategy, our strategy when we will be where we use micro trenching is that micro trenching it was basically used for our access. Access is uh, the, is the one that will distribute. Uh, uh, to our homes uh, using the FTTH uh, technology. Whereas HDD, we use it primarily for our backbone. It's a fiber link end to end. Again, both of them, we are using uh, micro ducts. This is, uh, this is our uh, micro trenching, and it is uh, used for rapid underground fiber optic deployment in urban areas. We are the uh, we are the company that has so many micro trenching machines, and uh, we have at least uh, about thirty of it. Uh, a strategy for micro trenching that we are follow uh, we follow some uh, eight steps. One is we do ground detection. Now there are so many uh, facilities uh, on the ground. We use uh, our GPR to detect. If there are facilities that we will be able to damage, of course, it's not 100% accurate, but we are eliminating majority of the uh, expected issues or problems. Once we have detected that, making the site, making the uh, work site uh, safe, we do have uh, some uh, security or guards or whatever, but uh, it's a mass also. But in some cases. There are some uh, Im implementation that uh, that uh, security is not uh, um, required. Manholes. We prepare our manholes, handholes for connectivity, and then uh, on the fourth one, we already do the uh, micro trenching. Micro trenching, we as we have said, we have uh, different type of machines, and the machines that are required. Uh, it depends on the type of soil. Now, uh, for hard, uh, say, pavements, we do use our uh, models, RT125 models. But for uh, unpaved roads, we use uh, another models. The one that uh, being shown here is a model which is RT80 or RT100. After we uh, trench, we clean the uh, Trench, uh, and then we put our uh, micro ducts.
after micro duct laying, we duct fill and then we uh, restore it back. Now, uh, that's the civil works portion. The next activity that we do is cable works. We do uh, fiber blowing. As discussed uh, previously, we, we are able to blow about uh, six kilometers per day. And then uh, our guys are doing uh, fiber splicing. Now, uh, the other activity that we do, we do HDD. In the provinces, uh, primarily for our backbone in uh, North Luzon, Central, even in Visayas and Mindanao, the primarily function of our HDD is uh, to, to connect city to city or province to province. Now, we are using uh, HDD to, uh, to eliminate uh, all this. We will not damage the uh, existing uh, payments uh, newly paid by the uh, DPWH. We cannot, we cannot uh, destroy the road if it's still under warranty. So that's why the majority of our implementation are being done through HDD. Now, HDD, uh, there's a high risk of, uh, cause, of uh, causing damage to existing underground facilities, but we, uh, we, uh, we uh, eliminate, eliminate those risks by, again, using our uh, GPRs. Now, uh, because HDD uh, requires so many machines, it has our water tanks, there's a uh, tendency that we also disrupt uh, traffic disruption. So that's why uh, the, the use of HDD versus uh, micro trenching really is uh, dependent on the type of location that we, what we use. Uh, FTTH by uh, micro trenching in the metropolis or urban areas, the experience that we had for converse slash metro which is that uh, we do micro trenching, but there's also a disadvantage for micro trenching. The first one, the probability of damage by future construction for micro trenching is very high. That's the experience that we have. Uh, the reason is that uh, the loads are every four years or five years, they are being uh, repaired by the government or DPWH. And if the uh, micro trenching is just shallow or 16 inches, uh, the damage is very uh, probable to be uh, damaged. But the positive side on micro trenching is that, number one, we only trench about two inches wide and uh, 12 inches to 16 inches deep. So the, the, the traffic, we are not uh, disrupting it. As you can see on the picture on the right side, this is an actual uh, micro trenching that we are uh, doing. It's, uh, if you notice, it's uh, about 9.34 in the morning. Traffic is still flowing. And then we are uh, doing micro trenching on the side of the road. And uh, because of micro trenching, we can do fast construction time. Uh, we we are uh, trenching about about 200 meters per per uh, half day per machine. So so uh, in one in one city, we will be able to do it in a couple of weeks time only. Now, uh, the other advantage of micro trenching, as we have experienced in our side, is that we, have, uh, we, are, we are not causing damage to existing underground facilities that are uh, already uh, uh, in uh, that are already in place a uh, long time ago. Another advantage for us is that we are uh, having lower costs, and the restoration is not uh, big because we are only is storing about 50 or two inches wide. And again, uh, the best thing is that it's easier to get ROW permits because we are not disrupting traffic. We can do uh, 
we can do micro trenching uh, on daytime. We can also do micro trenching uh, nighttime. Another example that we have done uh, for micro trenching is that uh, in one high end subdivision in uh, Metro Manila, it's Green Meadows. Uh, Green Meadows is a uh, it's a subdivision where in uh, it's a garden subdivision. Now, the the design that we did for this is that uh, we all the streets in front of the houses. We did micro trenching, and uh, we put also our service boxes, service boxes all around the places, and then uh, we put our handholds. And the best thing here is that all the houses are uh, served one hundred percent, and all of them are all underground. We made sure that uh, all. Uh, CF or uh, house entrance facilities, or sometimes we call it cable entrance facilities, they are also underground. We we put also small boxes. And if you're not, and uh, just to discuss further this, we also use uh, seven way as the main backbone, but we also use uh, the seven uh, three point five. As the distribution, this is the distribution is already going to the houses, while the seven, uh, while the fourteen ten uh, is the uh, backbone. Designing of TTE is using a combination of seven way and uh, twenty four way is uh, critical also. Another one. Uh, Green Meadows was a residential, is a residential area. Another example that we did uh, for using micro trenching is uh, CBD, which is the commercial business district of Makati. Now, uh, in Makati, I'm just, uh, I'm, what I'm showing is the main backbone, in which case we also put our handholds or manholds, and primarily we use seven way here. Uh, that the, the this one is a uh, example of uh, what we do at night time. And uh, I hope you can hear us. And uh, we also have uh, another micro trench machine. Uh, Vermeer, which we use it for unpaved roads. These are examples of our machine right now. And uh, in terms of uh, fiber blowing, as we as I have said, uh, we have our seven way, uh, which is the fourteen ten. We have also our 24 way, which is uh, primarily 7 slash 3.5. Those are the dimensions of the micro ducts. Now, uh, our experience, uh, the 7 way, when we started, we are blowing uh, 24, uh, sorry, we are blowing 48 uh, mini fiber. We were blowing then uh, 144 also. But right now, we believe or we see that the 144, because of the tremendous uh, requirement of rollout, the 144 uh, fibers are no longer enough. So what we are now blowing to the current uh, 7 uh, way 1410 is 288 fiber core, mini. So majority of uh, our fibers now, uh, we are blowing 288. But the blowing of uh, 288 is uh, quite very, very hard compared to the 144. 
These are our uh, fiber blowing machines. Uh, on the right side, on the right side of the picture is uh, our actual uh, fiber blowing also. Now, after the blowing, uh, of course, uh, we do splicing. These are actual splices that we are doing on the field. We do also do end-to-end -end, uh, cable testing. Now, uh, with all of those technologies, uh, micro trenching, type of blowing, using our micro ducts, HDD, uh, I'm showing you how we build our network. From uh, starting from year 2014, we have grown uh, logarithmically uh, with all those technologies that we have uh, done. As I've said uh, a while ago, uh, the, the backbone that we have been using, uh, using micro docs, it supports our FTT8 uh, lines. Today, we have uh, about 2 million lines. And then uh, 10 years ago, we are only about 100K. That's uh, how uh, micro docs help us. And on the right side, uh, I'm showing you the map of uh, Metro Manila, NCR, where we have a uh, almost covered uh, the area. Of course, capacity is a different one. But uh, in terms of reach, we have covered uh, from uh, Quezon City up to Las Piñas, uh, from top to bottom, and uh, Metro Manila and Manila on the uh, western side. And on the eastern side, we are in Antipolo. So again, as I've said, uh, the increase of the capacity that Converge has, uh, Metroverse being the implementing arm, uh, we have uh, increased tremendously. And uh, we do believe that uh, by continuing this in the next uh, years, we will be able to increase also uh, double our capacity in the next two years. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Edwin. Uh, it was really a nice uh, presentation, uh, including your application of uh, your operation that how you deploy the network. So uh, we will start our uh, next session, which is Q&A. Uh, we will take maybe 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, to all the audience, if you have any questions or queries, you can just write it down in the questions box uh, we will try our best to answer uh, those questions so we have started uh, getting the questions already uh, we will go one by one uh, so the first question is uh, from our friend Anil Pandey from India uh, his question is uh, to Willem uh, he, he uh, thanked you for uh, the nice presentation first. And then his question is, 
what does the future of blowing look like uh, can we see eight kilometer blowing coming up soon do you think water flotation is a superior technology you're on mute uh, I, I just muted myself i i, I saw you were still on mute. uh i think uh, the 5.3 kilometer uh, it's a very long length that you can achieve by blowing and if you see the theory then they they must have it was in switzerland they must have had some downhill i think normal blowing records are something like three three and a half kilometer and then it must be a nice straight route and that's about the limits for blowing unless you go to a larger duct for the same cable size but what they want to do is they want to have a maximum uh, fiber count in the duct or micro duct so for 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 blowing i think we are about at the limit but if you use water then we call it floating then there are the the sky is the limit i would say because there, there is only one friction contribution with the uh, with with the uh, blowing left that is the gravity friction and if you make the uh, there's of course also the cable stiffness friction but it is low but you can the gravity friction you can reduce it when using water because you have buoyancy and you make the cable effectively less heavy and you could even go to a cable weighing nothing and that you can do by making your cable special or you can even use water where you add brine okay i'm not saying that you have to do that but you could make the the gravity force uh, friction zero even and then the, i did some calculation with the uh, 100 kilometers should be possible really uh, but that is not what we reach today the record today of floating is 12.4 kilometer and that was done in a 40 millimeter duct with a, a, an optical cable of 20 millimeter i think it was and this 12.4 kilometer nothing special was done to the cable it was just a regular optical cable uh, the route was nice and straight that is necessary because if you have bending of the stiff cable that is the last friction contributor remaining can kill your 12.4 kilometers so this was done nicely uh, it was a nice straight route 12.4 kilometer and it was not the limit okay the cable was no longer and the duct was no longer but i can tell you the cable came out with the same speed as they started the installation it was done with a triple super jet uh, this in initial speed was 50 meter per minute and it came out the cable with 50 meter per, per minute and then the other detail is that the cable came almost at the same time out as the water so that means that there was not much uh, velocity difference between the cable and the and the water and then you say okay how how was it advanced that that's another effect that is the there are two effects there is the hydrodynamic uh, friction and there's the or a drag forces and hydrostatic drag forces. That is just the pressure drop over the cable volume. And that was already enough to get the cable that far. So that means that potentially this route could have been much longer than only the cables would have to go down to have still a significant water speed higher than the cable speed. Now talking about the speed of the water, this is a duct, a 40 millimeter duct. If you have a micro duct, then you really have a problem with the speed. Uh, if you go to 12.4 kilometers, that I, I would not recommend that for microduct. Uh, to give you an idea, with a 10 millimeter microduct, we could reach six kilometers by floating, but then the cable came out with 20 meters per minute, and maybe at the end close to 10 meters per minute. Uh, then you're reaching the limits concerning speed. So if you go further, then the speed will go down, and if you have to do an installation with one meter per minute, it's no fun anymore. I would say that. And then 20 kilometers you can calculate how long it costs but there is a future especially for floating for blowing okay we do it already for more than three decades i think we reached the limits there but for floating there is still a bright future to beat records is that answering the question yeah uh thank you for the answer i think uh, that suffices the question so uh we have got some more questions coming in. Uh, so Anil Pande, uh, again, uh, his, his question this time to Edwin. Uh, uh, 
uh, he he thanked you for the nice presentation uh, so his question is what is the installation distance that you achieve with water flotation what percentage of your network deployment is with water flotation um well uh all our building we are uh, using only air uh, i i am not sure if that is the question of uh, anil but uh what we're doing is that uh, we are uh, uh fiber blowing our mic uh, our uh, fibers into the 1410 and we are uh, able to achieve about uh, 500 meters max but we do have our uh, manholes in between so we do sequential uh, blowing and then uh, out of that we will we are able to blow up to uh, four kilometers uh, going left going right two from the two kilometers each side so and two that's the thing that we are doing uh, one one reel of uh, fiber okay great uh, thank you edwin so our next question is from our uh, board member rajkumar mathai uh, his question is uh, i think to willem uh is is there any special requirements for fiber like proof test level or bend in insensitivity for fiber blowing cables uh, i can give you a short answer no but i can also make the answer better if you would have a cable where you have where, where you install the old technique by pulling then you reach the maximum pulling force of your cable and you have to take care that you're not exceeding the stress in your fibers normally uh, fibers can have a lot today but it could be that you have to pull and exceed that force with blowing you are an order of magnitude less in forces on the cable so you can you could make cables specially developed for blowing with uh, and some companies claim to have specially developed cables for blowing that are not as strong as the the the, com uh, the, the conventional uh, fiber of the cables but normally it's the standard optical cables that are blown and there's no additional problem with it for lifetime it only gets better okay uh thank you for the answer so our next question is from uh, carlos rivera uh his question i think uh, again to willem uh, he he's asked that uh I'm about to start a blowing project in the next three weeks. Uh, the question is, is really needed an intercooler between air compressor and a blowing machine? What is the average temperature of the air coming out from the compressor? Ah, uh, yeah, that is depending on where you use the compressor. Uh, so if you go to Scandinavia in the winter, you don't need an aftercooler. You must only take care that uh, that they're not water in the ducts freezing but if you are in a hot area then you need an after cooler for your compressor and i i don't know what the temperature can be but i have seen already in the netherlands on a hot summer day that you almost burn your hands to the to the cable blowing machine and then your blowing distance reduces of course but we have in the, in my area never problems with uh, with fiber blow with with cable blowing uh, the only thing is with micro duct blowing uh, if you can also blow the micro ducts and their temperature is more of an issue because you can implode the micro ducts if you don't do all the necessary precautions if you blow micro ducts you can have a higher pressure outside the micro duct than inside when you don't pressurize them uh, initially and that is what we recommend to do always but if you don't do that and you go to a high temperature then they implode earlier so what happens typically is when you have your uh, you, you have a temporary stop of your bundle blowing and then the air is hot and it also gets uh, i mean if it's further in the duct it's cooling down so when you blow uh, 100 meter further in the duct you don't have problem with the temperature anymore but then it's the, the, the micro ducts in the machine they have time to increase in temperature and to implode so this is really something that that you have to take care of but for the rest uh use after coolers and normally no problems but i cannot tell you uh, 
temperature is really dependent on the application, where you are, and humidity of the air is also doing something, but I have no rule of thumb, but it can be in a tremendous heating up of the air if you use a compressor in hot climate, and then use after coolers. Thank you for the answer. So uh, he he wrote again to me that uh, he's from Caribbean. Use uh, use an after cooler. <laughs> yeah, sure. And after okay. that, take a cool uh, dip in the in the swimming pool. Yeah. Uh, okay. So our next question is from Charles Cole. Uh, his question again to Willem. Uh, so he asked about the lubricant. Uh, what is the role of lubricant in blowing? Uh, what advantages does lubricant bring in terms of uh, distance and speed of installation? Now, in fact, the lubricant is one of the, the major differences between 1987 when we blew 700 meters and to do, today when we can each reach even 5.3 kilometers. Uh, lubricant is important. And it's a good question, by the way, because uh, we can also tell you uh, what is the best to do? You can lubricate, of course, the microduct that never harms, but uh, it's difficult, especially the small size microducts, it's difficult to spread the lubricant well. Uh, we also have a cable lubricator, and we also have the special lubricant for that, that is the jetting loop. And for microducts, we have micro jetting loop. This is really uh, the difference. If you don't lubricate, sometimes you can go three, four times as far when you just use the cable lubricator. and the cable lubricator is a, 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 an add-on to our blowing machines. Uh, some of them are such that you can place them in line in the duct, so you don't even need to connect it to the blowing machine, but just put it in line. Uh, they, of course, uh, uh, most of them are dividable, so you can take it out later. And they really make a difference. And the, the amount of lubricant for a cable lubricator is very little, so you don't need much lubricant, and they make a hell of a difference. Uh, you can even use those cable lubricators in in, in cold climate. Uh, yeah, you are in warm climate, but in Scandinavia they had minus 20 degrees. If you then try to uh, lubricate your microduct, uh, it's freezing and uh, your phone plug will, will stuck somewhere uh, halfway and you have to wait until summer that you can try to free it. Uh, the cable lubricator, you just take care that it's warm when you start and maybe you use a phone to keep it warm. But then it's applying a very thin layer of this lubricant on the cable jacket. And then, in fact, you are skating with the cable. And uh, in, in fact, you reach in those freezing conditions even further than in, in high temperatures. So lubricant, yes, it makes a difference. And cable lubrication, uh, the cable lubricator is the best. That's Thank you. Uh, so just 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 for the record, so uh, we will stretch another 10 to 15 minutes because I have got lots of questions from audience. Uh, so this time I'm uh, going to Edwin. Uh, I've got one question from uh, one of our friends, uh, Stephen Foster. Uh, his question is, uh, what is the most difficult uh, problem you experience with micro -tren trenching? Uh, what causes the most problems, do you think? Well, uh, the difficult one is uh, not the actual trenching, but once it becomes uh, damaged, that's when the problem arises. Let's take a uh, micro duct, uh, a portion by portion. That's a thing that will uh, become a problem. But first time to do micro trenching, it's not that uh, big issue. It's really a storing a damaged micro duct. That is the uh, bigger one. Okay. Uh, thank you for the answer. So uh, to Willem again. So uh, our friend Anil Pande just uh, asked another uh, referring question to his last one. Uh, his now his question is wondering why hasn't flotation become as popular as blowing uh, are there some serious challenges in flotation like cost perhaps now cost i don't think so because you use the same equipment uh, and it's maybe yeah, you can use a we we have hydro caps that that is a machine that gives you 
the hydraulic so usually we use a, a hydraulic uh, jet because that is easier to go with a little bit lower speed uh, so then we have hydraulic pressure for the for the motor to drive the cable and a water pump for the water and it's a very compact machine uh, altogether i don't have pictures here in my presentation but if you look at the whole thing is smaller than a compressor and then you have your water and your your drive force all together uh, and the same uh, for instance a mini jet can do it a super jet can do it uh, we even have yeah that is the those are the best machines for it but uh, you can also do it with other machines it's not more expensive the only thing is you have to get access to water now, if you do microduct uh, technology then you just can take a cubic of water that is usually enough uh, for larger ducts you really need much much more water and that means that you have to to, to get it and if something comes because it's a uh, if you really want to make benefit of the floating, the, the water goes faster than the cable, if you really want to go far. And that means that also a lot of water is coming out and you have to get rid of that. Uh, so that could be one drawback. If you're in a country like in the Netherlands, uh, you just uh, take the water from the canal and you put it back into the canal. There are canals everywhere, but it's not, uh, not everywhere, it's the truth. So especially for the larger ducts, you need a lot of water. Uh, the other thing is that if you have a, a hilly area uh, elevations then you have to take into account if you go one uh, 10 meters up you have to put one bar extra if you go 100 meter up you have 10 bar already so uh, 200 meter up would be a challenge with floating so then it's not uh, the right technique unless you go down then you don't even need to pump the water goes uh, you just let the water in you can pour it in and if you pour hard enough then uh, it will take the cable with with you and the gravity helps the cable and also the water flow then the res uh, the, the risk is that you have too high pressure in the duct at the downside that you explode the duct uh, 20 bar is still okay for normally for a polyethylene sdr 11 pipe but if you go uh, 400 meter down you explode the duct so short um, you have a water management issue and if you have elevations you could have an issue uh, those are the drawbacks of the floating for the rest it's only advantages okay so his uh, another question is so the machine equipment cost for flotation is cheaper than blowing is it uh, i don't i'm not a salesman i think it's about comparable because yeah we sell this uh, this water pump uh, hydro cup unit but we don't sell uh, compressors directly. Uh, we, I, I, I'm sure that Michael van Moppes can answer this because he is our, uh, our sell, selling person in uh, Asia Pacific and he knows more about it than me. So please contact Michael van Moppes for that question. Sorry, not okay. answering that. Got it. So I think Anil already uh, in contact to uh, William, uh, Michael. So uh, let's let's move to the next question from Adnan Siddiqui from Pakistan. Uh, so his question is, uh, how much air pressure will be required for one kilometer of distance in one go? Or what will be the parameters to calculate uh, the time versus distance? So uh, as, as difficult to carry huge compre air compressor with the installation setup to Willem, please. So the question is, how much air pressure do I need for one kilometer? Yes. Yeah, that's one of kilometer. course. It's depending on the, on the parameters, on the trajectory, the cable, the duct, the friction coefficient, whether you use a cable lubricator or not. Uh, we have software to calculate that. Uh, normally, uh, if if the trajectory is not too bad, you can reach, uh, say, thousand meter with ten bar easily, and fifteen hundred meter with fifteen bar easily. In, in one go and if you need to go further and then you can use the machines in tandem of course like uh, Edwin is doing um, but you can also have situations uh, the, the 5.3 kilometers is also in one blow and a lot of uh, operators they, they reach more than two kilometers in one blow it's all depending on your trajectory and if you have a typical question uh, we have software to calculate your typical uh, question and, and give you an answer 
Uh, the only missing factor is then normally the coefficient of friction between cable and duct. And for that, uh, you could send cable and duct samples to Switzerland and we can do a friction test. Uh, we have uh, advanced friction test facilities also for, uh, for cable blowing. Uh, of course, we have a test trajectory, but then you need to test uh, one kilometer. But we also have the dynamic friction test where we can do a test on 20 meter cable and duct length and then give you a pretty good forecast of what you can blow if knowing your trajectory, which we have to put into our software then. Okay, got it. Thank you uh, for the answer. So another, uh, our next question is from Rajiv uh, from Sri Lanka Telecom. Uh, his question to Willem, I think, uh, he asked that, uh, could you please let us know whether it is possible to use the blowing technology for the ducts which have one or two existing cables in it or do we have to use empty ducts for this purpose no you can use them for uh, already occupied ducts uh, we have experience with that uh, also calculation tools to calculate what are your possibilities of course the blowing length reduces because there's less airflow uh, passing to the duct when you have already cables in and you have wedging of the cables and the uh, wedging of the new cable with the old uh, cables. Uh, we have a special uh, Y piece, what you can use that you, to connect your blowing uh, equipment and, and, and feeding duct to the existing line. So you, that, that, that you can bypass the old cables without cutting them because you don't want to. Of course, you can start at the, at the entrance, but you don't want to cut the cables you have already. So we have even done installations where the cable, well, that's in fact a normal practice, but it was also measured once in the Netherlands where we had already a cable in use. That was one of the cables installed in 1987 with the first cable jets. And there were only six fibers inside. And at that time it was said the duct is full. Now we could upgrade those ducts by installing two micro ducts. It's easier to install a micro duct than to install a cable and uh, that we could do over short lengths of only 300 meter 200 300 meter because there was paraffin oil the old lubricant inside the duct so it was not easy to blow long lengths but it doesn't matter for a micro duct you just do short lengths and you connect them by push pull connectors so we had installed two micro ducts of 10 millimeter and not only we have a, a new route for the cable for new cables but it's also uh, uh, what is it? enhanced blowing performance so in that we could blow 96 fiber cables in each so we started with six fibers duct full we upgraded it with two micro ducts in each we could blow 96 fiber cables and they could be blown over 1500 meter length so you of course you can also blow additional cables it's up to you but uh, in some cases it's better to to use uh, micro ducts than to do it but it's it's all possible yes okay so uh, our next question uh, is from sanjeev cole uh, probably from india uh, what is the role of micro ducts and micro cables in enterprise connectivity i'm not sure we, uh, who will take I can answer that. Um, yeah, please. For, yeah. For us, our experience for microduct is that uh, for the bigger microducts, we are using it for backbone. And then for smaller microducts, the 7, uh, 3.5, we are only blowing uh, 24 core. And uh, sometimes we only blow, uh, blow a 12. Those are intended for corporate and uh, enterprise so it depends on the uh, micro duct that that you install so so for example uh, going inside the building we also have the uh, 7 3.5 but uh, of course it can only uh, support uh, up to 24 mini mini uh, fiber so that's uh, uh, our experience on our side it's uh, it depends on the usage and what to install as the micro duct. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I have uh, 
one or two questions to both of the speakers. Uh, so first question is to uh, uh, Willem that uh, we we see as this is this is this is really a revolutionary technology and this is the best practice we have in the industry to blow the table. So, but uh, what are the main challenges do you think uh, from any operator uh, from using this technology really? Because we sometimes, uh, most of the times in the developing countries, we see people are using uh, leg, uh, man labor to do this job. So what, what are the main challenges from your perspective uh, uh, which is actually stopping uh, operators to uh, use this technology? Um, yeah, this would be typical a question for Michael because he is faced with this issue uh, every day in his business. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's, it's good uh, to, so you, are, you have things, what is the cost price in, of the whole operation? But it could also be what is the speed at which you can do the work so if you need to finish your project in time, it's sometimes not possible with man labor and you need the blowing equipment. Uh, then also we, we have uh, in we have there is a publication that you can find also on the, on our website what gives you a calculation how much uh, man hours you need to install a job. And then it is sometimes surprising that if you use many machines in in tandem and especially if the operators are not expensive to do that then you can reach the fastest installation and the less men the, the least man hours sometimes it's surprising an eye opener and that is the, always difficult to communicate they look at the price of a machine and, and not at what you can save with it in time but also in cost and yeah, in the Netherlands, it was clear uh, the, the cost price of the machine was earned back in one month. So uh, if, you, if you have to install uh, years, then of course you earn a lot of money. In developing countries, it's a little bit different and in, indeed a challenge for Michael, but it's sometimes surprising how much you can earn on cost, time and men and uh, hours. Okay. Uh, got it. So my uh, question to Edwin, uh, that you're really doing a fantastic job in Philippines uh, deploying the fiber networks. Uh, so uh, if I ask you the, that what is the future plan of the Converge uh, in coming five years, that uh, where do you uh, want to go in terms of deployment and uh, customer base? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, based on our plan, we continue to roll out our FTTH. Uh, we, fo we will focus on that. And then not only on the uh, urban area, but we do plan to cover a majority uh, of the uh, Philippine areas, especially uh, Visayas and Mindanao. Uh, today, we are, as, uh, as presented a while ago in my presentation, we are expanding heavily in uh, Visayas and Binalao, the Inter Islands. And uh, our focus, FTTH, uh, fiber to the home, fiber to the building. And uh, we believe that's, uh, that's the company's direction as of now, uh, from now until uh, five years. We are, uh, we are heavy on that. And then we are doing good business uh, on that one. Okay, great. Uh, we, we, we hope uh, everything goes fine uh, and uh, you, you achieve your goals. So I, I think we are almost at the uh, ending of this webinar today. I'd really like to thank our two uh, kindest speakers uh, for, for their time. Uh, for for this webinar that they had really uh, very uh, in-depth presentation of their thoughts and uh, we really had a great q and a session today we really thank you uh, for being being with us uh, on behalf of FTTH Council Asia Pacific on and also from the audience aside 
So great, uh, thank you everyone. We appreciate you being here even in the busy schedule amidst uh, this pandemic. So our Cyber Talk webinar series initiative will running. Uh, we'll keep running and uh, our next uh, webinar is on the display. So it's on 17th of November. Uh, it will be uh, broadly uh, on rural broadband and dig digital divide. So details uh, will be shared with you uh, shortly, including the registration links and everything. So please uh, stay tuned through our social media pages in LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And uh, thanks again for uh, joining us today uh, in this webinar. So thanks to uh, Dr. Willem and uh, Edwin again. So thanks very much. So we will say goodbye to uh, all of you now. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.